Good evening. Together we'll crack it, says the new campaign against crime, and that's what we hope to do tonight. Crack some of the cases that detectives can't solve on their own. Maybe you'll see a face that you recognise, or a pattern of events that seems familiar. The detectives in question are here in the studio, the programme's live, as always, and however you might help on any crime, they're waiting for your call. The number, as always, is 01811 8055. We're hoping to unravel several cases tonight in particular. A robbery in Hartlepool by a gang with walkie-talkies and a whole series of getaway cars. Fraudsters in Yarmouth who took home videos of themselves and then left the cassette behind. And the killing of 20-year-old Lynette White, who was found stabbed in a flat in Cardiff. And also later on in the programme, we'll have news on how investigations are proceeding into last month's cases. We start with the reconstruction of a fire bombing in Chester. The devices that were planted in four estate agents are the latest in a series of attacks of arson. For nine years now, two or more people have attempted to set fire to holiday homes in North Wales. The fire raisers have sometimes called themselves the Sons of Glendower. Ostensibly, the attacks have been aimed at English interests in Wales, although Welsh-owned properties have been damaged too, and Welsh nationalists have fiercely denounced the fire bombers, accusing them of bringing Welsh nationalism into disrepute. An isolated hillside in Snowdonia. It's a scene that's been repeated throughout North and Mid Wales. Since the fires began in 1979, over 130 cottages have been attacked. An average of over one a month. The first technique was crude petrol and a naked flame. But the sophistication grew and so did the danger. Outside the Port Maddock tax office, a father and son discovered a carrier bag. The boy actually tugged at some wires. Had it exploded, it could have killed him. In fact, household chemicals are mixed now to make a substance much like napalm. Typically, the bombs are triggered by equity clocks, or legend ones, and they're made in broadly the same way. Distinctive copper-coloured crocodile clips are used, a type made in Japan. The single-stranded wire is of a sort that's used in computers or electric typewriters. Sometimes metal components act like shrapnel. Two years ago, two policemen and a bomb disposal expert had removed one of these devices from a building. They placed it safely, they thought, on open ground. As the attacks continued, evidence about the bombers began to accumulate. In September 1986, detectives found a footprint. Then a member of the public alerted police to a nearby quarry. He'd seen two brand new rucksacks floating in a lake. A police dog handler was sent to check them out, and inside one he found a shoe that matched the footprint. It was a size 11 Go Sport sports shoe. He also found a pair of black woolen gloves, a black stocking, and two anoraks with leggings, one green and one blue, both trademarked schooner. There was also a stingray pocket torch and a pair of size eight and a half Puma sports shoes. And from forensic evidence, police now know the blood group and the hair type of at least one of the people involved. It's Saturday, February the 27th. This is Chester city centre. It's an ancient city crammed with timbered buildings, potentially a tinderbox. At five o'clock, the shops began to close and streets began to empty. But in the evening, the city comes alive again as people stream back to restaurants and nightclubs.
Come get the fire brigade, Sally. Right, stand back. I don't know. There's a little fire up here. Right. At the top of the end. Right. Sarge. Yeah, Peter, yeah. get an extinguisher. Off it. There's another estate agent for me. All right, come on. Peter, quick. Get an extinguisher. In there. At the bottom. On the side, there. Chief Inspector, urgent. Chief Inspector, go ahead. Yes, a second fire. Better through the estate agents. Can you get all patrols to urgently check? Every estate agent within the city centre for signs of fire or incendiary devices. It is urgent. Yes, sir. Roger, message understood. Control to all patrols, all patrol city centre. Could you please make a check of all estate agents, all estate agents' premises, reference possible fires. Four bombs went off in Chester on that night. As in other incidents, no one was killed or injured. But frankly, that's been out of luck as much as judgment. Gwyn Williams, how can people help? As we've seen, these devices are powerful. And I'm really worried that somebody before long will be killed or seriously injured. I know that the people who wore that clothing were involved in those fires in September of 1986, and I'm anxious to speak to anyone who saw those people. Right. Now, these clocks, I gather that these legend and equity clocks uh, have been used in really quite a number of attacks. That's right. We, we're quite satisfied that these clocks and various other parts have been used in all the devices we've come across in the last six months or so. Now, that presumably means that someone has bought them in a batch or stolen them in a batch, got them from a mail-order company or something, and a whole, a whole lot of them together. That's right. We're particularly anxious to speak to anyone who, who, who may have handled these clocks. It's quite probable that somebody bought them in batches, as you say, of four or six. Uh, and certainly the wires and the clips are yeah. of considerable interest to us. Obviously, you need... To Anybody in Chester on Saturday, 27th of February, remembers seeing anybody posting things into estate agents sometime after 5 o'clock. That stands to reason. You said, though, at the beginning you were really worried people are going to get killed or injured in time. It hasn't happened so far, it must be said. Certainly, it hasn't happened yet. And I would pose the question to anybody who has any information, in particular people who might be on the fringe of these groups. Examine your conscience. Can you live with a child killed or seriously injured. I don't want to find myself one night in a hospital or in, perhaps in a mortuary. And I would ask those poor people to certainly come forward. In part, this is about the Welsh language. Um, maybe you should address part of your appeal in Welsh. Certainly. Mae gen i ofn rhyw ddiwrnod y ceith na rhywun i ladd. Y dowch mi roi dy cwestiwn yma i chi. A fe trwch chi fyw efo'ch cydwybod, os oes gynnoch chi rhyw wybodaeth sydd o ddefnydd i ni. Os oes gynnoch chi, ffoniwch ni rhywun. Well, whatever language you speak, please call if you have any information. You can talk to a BBC researcher if you prefer. Of course, you can ask for a Welsh speaker. If you wish, you can remain anonymous. The number is 01811 8055. That's 01811 8055. Or you can call the incident room, that's on 0492 518 383. That's 0492, the code for Colwyn Bay, 518 383. Well, now some news of progress as a result of last month's call to crime watch. There's been a great deal of activity in the hunt for whoever killed Cathy Walsh. 
One night last October, Cathy played bingo and then travelled home by bus from Tooting in South London to her home not far away in Mitcham. She was murdered in her house later that night. We appealed for help to trace the man in a photograph discovered in Cathy's possessions. And while the programme was still on the air, a man presented himself at Enfield Police Station and he was able to help detectives fill in some details about Cathy's life. In a quite separate development, a viewer's call has put police on an entirely new line of inquiry, which does seem promising, but they've asked us not at the moment to release details. We had rather less success on that extraordinary hold-up in Oxford city centre. Two men attacked a security van, they held the crew at gunpoint, and then in full view of office workers and passers-by, stopped a line of traffic and shot at a police car. The pair fled empty-handed, having failed to break into the security van's vaults. No fewer than 69 names were suggested by Crime Watch viewers, but I have to say police have ruled out most of them. They're still anxious for more leads. We'll let you know what develops. Well, police in Fife have asked us to make yet another appeal about the killing of Linda Hunter. Linda disappeared from her home in Carnoustie on Friday the 21st of August last year. Her body was discovered just five weeks ago off the Dundee Kirkcaldy Road. Since our last programme, a viewer said he'd seen Linda's car travelling south to England. In fact, it had been discovered dumped in Manchester. Now, two more viewers have come forward, and as a result of their information, police would particularly like to hear from anybody who saw a white Vauxhall Cavalier having its wheel changed on a roundabout just south of the Forth Bridge. There might have been a white Ford or a Maestro van parked nearby. Or if anyone was at the Moss filling station on the A74, just inside the Cumbria border, at 2.15 that morning, that morning, that's 2.15 a.m. on August the 22nd. Were you at the roundabout or that filling station at the time? If you were, please do call us. It's 01 811 8055. We'll have more news later in the programme, and of course we'll keep you up to date on the calls that are coming in right now. First to Incident Desk, here are Constable Helen Phelps and Superintendent David Hatcher. Police in Middlesex are baffled by the death of John Lawrence, an ophthalmic nursing tutor. He was murdered sometime between 4.40pm on Sunday the 7th of February and 10am on Tuesday the 9th in his flat at the back of this house in Isleworth. Several items, like this Nesco compact disc player, are missing from his flat. Now a distressed cry was heard by a neighbour between 10.30 and midnight on Sunday the 7th. and We are anxious to trace two youths who were seen outside his flat about the same time. Although it was cold, one was seen taking off a dark, speckly pullover, revealing a light-coloured T-shirt. He seemed upset and was being consoled by the other. John Lawrence was a homosexual and frequently visited pubs and casinos where he met young men. Although it's known he'd eaten a large lunch that Sunday, a frying pan with a hamburger and chips was found in his kitchen and the table was laid for one with a choice of two different sauces, so maybe he was cooking for someone else. On Monday the 8th of February, his wallet, jewellery, letters and credit cards were found in Twickenham Railway Station on waste ground by the stairs leading to the Waterloo-bound platform. His Royal College of Nursing diary, one like this, and his watch are still missing. If you were waiting at Twickenham Station for the 1.25am train to Waterloo that night, did you notice anyone acting suspiciously? If so, or if you remember seeing or speaking to John Lawrence after 4.40pm on that Sunday afternoon, please ring us here now. We need to speak to three men who we believe might have important information about a series of frauds in Great Yarmouth, Manchester, Somerset and Merseyside. Last June, this house in Yarmouth was rented by three men, calling themselves Ronald Silverman, David Silverman and Philip Parry. Using their landlord's name, they opened bank accounts, made false credit agreements and opened a sportswear business. In November, they vanished, having fraudulently obtained over £150,000 worth of goods. Their debts in other parts of the country total more than a quarter of a million pounds. When Norfolk Police searched the house, they found this video cassette. What was recorded on it was very interesting. These are shots of the premises that the sportswear business was run from. These are shots of Great Yarmouth. But listen to the voices of the men in the car. And I'll go round here and go back up to there. Well, it's outdoor, really, isn't it? The Manchester accent belongs to this man. 
He's six foot two inches tall. He calls himself David John Silverman. This part of the video was shot at the BBC's Antiques Roadshow in June last year. The man with the briefcase claims to be Ronald Silverman, David's stepson. He has a Liverpool accent, is five foot nine inches tall, and may well have a common law wife and a very young child. The third man, known as Philip Parry, doesn't feature on the video, but was photographed at an exhibition by a local paper. He is five foot eight inches tall with no discernible accent. Now back to the subject of antiques. Have you seen one of these recently? It's a copper diver's helmet, and a similar one was taken from the Dolphin pub on the fish wharf at Great Yarmouth. The theft is believed to be connected with the frauds. So if you know the whereabouts of Mr Parry, Mr Ronald Silverman, or Mr David Silverman, or even the helmet, ring us now. Now Crime Watch UK goes international. Police in Holland are hoping you can put a name to this face. It's an artist's impression of a man who was found dead on the 14th of January this year. He was discovered on this stretch of waste ground beside the main A8 and A10 roads outside Amsterdam. The body had been weighted and dumped in a water-filled ditch. Holland's Avro television showed the man's face on their own version of Crime Watch in the hope that someone would recognise him, but they drew a blank. Amsterdam police approached us because the clothes the man was dressed in are all British made, so perhaps he was a British citizen. All his clothes had their labels removed, but police have identified their manufacturers. The jacket and trousers were made by Barber and Sons, and the trouser legs have been shortened by hand. His shoes were size 7, made by Cheney. Take another look at him. He was 5 foot 8 inches tall, and for viewers in the Netherlands, that's 1 metre 70. He's of athletic build and was probably about 25 to 30 years old. He probably wore those glasses most of the time, so if you know who he is, or if you think you've seen him in Britain or in Holland, call us now. Next, we need your help to trace the last owner of a German semi-automatic pistol, which may solve a top-level police inquiry into the supplying of illegal weapons. The gun, a Mauser, carries a serial number 142503. We believe that it was imported into the country by a collector or a souvenir hunter, who then gave it to a middleman. It's that middleman who is crucial to the inquiry, and we only need the collector to identify him. Look at the gun again. Do you remember seeing it in someone's collection? If so, call us now. Last July, we reconstructed the murder of Christopher Cumley, a North London jeweller. On the morning of Wednesday the 17th of June, two men came into the shop and Mr Cumley was shot at point-blank range. Just a few gold chains were stolen. The detectives still hunting the men have recovered these from a garden incinerator in South London. In all, there were 30 watches, mostly Nevada make, and these jeweller's ring cases. They're not from Mr Cumley's shop, but it's likely they have come from a robbery of another jeweller's. Do you know where? Call us if you can help in any way. The number to ring is 01811 8055. That's 01811 8055. Well, now, a distinctive car could be the key to solving our next case, which is an armed robbery on a van making a delivery to a sub post office on a housing estate in Hartlepool. In the course of the raid, the gang used no less than four different cars. The most distinctive was a red BMW. There are only six like it in the whole of the northeast of England. And in the last few weeks before the robbery, several witnesses remember seeing it near the housing estate where the raid took place. For security reasons, we won't be showing any details of the post office van or the robbery itself. Our reconstruction takes place in Hartlepool in Cleveland. This is the central estate on the north side of the town just a month before the robbery. A local resident, Mrs Davis, was trying to call her GP. Is it working, Mrs? Yes, my number's engaged. You can have it. Go oh, on, Mrs Davis says she remembers the BMW because it wasn't the sort of car she'd seen on the estate before. Right. Oh, we're in the bit late this morning. I've had a bit of an accident. Oh, I got a smack in the back bumper. I'll be all right. But she couldn't see any damage to the back of the car.
Three weeks later, on another Friday morning, about a mile from the central estate, this woman saw what police now think was a dummy run of the getaway. She remembers the men were smartly dressed and carried walkie-talkies. And the BMW was seen again, this time on the morning of the robbery. At half past eight, near the phone box on the edge of the estate, a man in a trilby hat and camel coat was seen waiting beside it. The robbers must have had specialist knowledge, because in this junction box there are several telephone cables, but they knew exactly which one was connected to the central estate. The phones were still working ten minutes before the robbery, as in a nearby factory, this clerk was ringing the post office to order some stamps. And 15 at one pound. Bye. Seconds later, all lines to the estate were dead. The regular delivery van was now just entering the estate on its way to the sub post office. Next door to the post office, the milkman was delivering to the grocery shop as usual. You want to eat, love? Yeah, good morning. Uh, the usual. Yeah. There you go, love. The first signs of the impending robbery were probably seen by Jane Robotham out shopping with her oh. children. Five minutes, when she's gone, we'll go for it. She was frightened and walked by. As the van driver went to inform the post office that the delivery had arrived, this Bedford Astra reversed up behind the van. Right, get him down! Get down, you bastard! Get out, get down, son, or I'll rock this round your neck! Come on, man! Stay down, you bastard! Stay down, you bastard! Come on, man! Five men were seen getting into the BMW, it must have stopped shortly afterwards for some of the gang to get out. By the time it arrived here, about a mile away, only two men were seen leaving it and getting into this silver Granada. Well, from the map, you can see that from Warren Court, the Granada travelled about a quarter of a mile to Tenby Walk, where it was found abandoned. Then from Tenby Walk, it's about 100 yards to here, Gower Walk, where we know that about half past eight on the morning of the robbery, a silver Nissan Bluebird was seen pulling into this parking bay here. Police now believe that Nissan was planted here as a getaway car, and we know that the Granada was stolen from Northumbria, Northumbria. But where the bluebird came from or where it went to remains quite a mystery so far. Maybe we'll find out in the course of this programme. And the gang got away with several thousand pounds worth of cash and stamps and car tax discs. Mr Newsom is in charge of the case. The most noticeable, of course, of those cars, as I said, was the red BMW Alpina, which was stolen six months before the raid. Where do you think it was during those six months? Well, normally a gang would uh, store a car before use in a robbery, but that car had done 2,000 miles and must have been seen in the area, possibly the Tyneside area, and certainly at petrol filling stations. So people must come forward if they saw a car they Yes, and particularly that. Alpina. And the Silver Granada was also stolen from Northumberland, not so noticeable as a car, but some quite interesting and distinctive things stolen from it. Yes, a very valuable set of Ben Hogan Apex golf clubs, 
had been in the car when it was stolen and those were missing when the car was recovered. Right. Those we're showing actually aren't the original ones. We do have just one that was left behind with a tan handle. These all look the same. Yes, the owner had kept this in his possession and in fact um, these were specially made for a very tall man. They've been extended by two inches and the handle is leather compared to the normal handle which is a different colour. So these would be quite useless then to a normal sized golfer? That's right, they are quite distinctive. So maybe somebody in all innocence has come by these golf clubs and uh, that could be a vital lead to the gang. It could. The other thing that was left in the car was the driving licence. You brought in a replica there. Yes, the owner of the Granada was a Mr Alistair Smith of Morpeth. Now that driving licence may have been used to hire vehicles and I'm particularly interested in any that have been hired in the Tyneside area, possibly by the gang, um, under that name. Now we have two video fits people might recognise, we hope. One of a man who was seen parking the Nissan Bluebird, where we saw just now, in Gower Walk. Yes, he's described by a witness as being about 35 years of age, thin, uh, short, curly, dark hair, and he's supposed to look a little bit like Robert Powell, the actor. Mm. And the second one was a man who was seen sitting in the passenger seat of the Red Astra van at about the time the cables, the telephone cables, were being cut. That's right, slightly younger, 30 to 35 years of age. You can see he's got short dark hair with a fringe which actually comes over his forehead and he was described by the witness as being good looking. Where do you think the gang is from? I do believe the gang's from Tyneside. Right, and the date we're talking about is Friday the 12th of February and the weeks leading up to that. If you recognise any of those cars we showed you, or if you can tell us anything you think might help the police to find these men, please do ring us here in the studio. The number is 01 811 8055, or dial Cleveland Police Direct, and that number is 0642 248 184. That's 0642, the code for Middlesbrough, 248 184. I can tell you we're having a large number of calls on that Welsh arson or the series of attacks uh, which included the, the one in Chester. And one caller says he recognised the waterproof clothes. He rang off without um, giving his name or any more details and uh, detectives would like him to call back. Some uh, more results from last month's programme. Nearly 300 viewers called on one appeal alone, that of the murder of Fiona Gallant. Fiona, an 18-year-old, was last seen alive, apparently giving directions to a lorry driver near her home, which was near Colchester. As a result of Crime Watch, detectives now have 40 positive new leads. And after calls to last month's programme, a man was arrested the next day in Eastbourne in Sussex. He's been charged with armed robbery of building societies carried out in Richmond in Surrey and elsewhere around the London area. Because the trial is pending, we can't now give further details at the moment. And thanks to Crime Watch viewers, there have been fresh developments in the Barry Lewis case. Last month, we showed a clip from our reconstruction that we'd filmed over two years ago. And it prompted two very important new witnesses to come forward, fresh witnesses who remember Barry with a man in Essex. Detectives, though, still need to hear from the anonymous caller who led them to a red Talbot Horizon parked in a garage in South London. Please call again, 01 that one call could save thousands of wasted man hours and perhaps save other children's lives. Well, now to photo call, television's version of the wanted poster, who are suspects caught on photo, film or video. Here again are David Hatcher and Helen Phelps. Can you help identify this man, seen here on the 15th of February in the Cheshire Building Society in Queen's Ferry, North Wales? He threatened staff with a sawn-off shotgun and passed over this note demanding £2,000. The cashier gave him a lesser amount and he escaped on foot into Station Road. Look at him again, he's a very distinctive man, only about 5'1 to 5'3 tall and aged about 60. He was wearing a rust-coloured ski jacket with white sleeves and a chest panel. His hair is grey and he has a trimmed moustache. Notice those protruding teeth with the gap in the middle. If you recognise him, ring us now. This man stole a car in Middlesbrough after violently threatening its owner and tying her up in her own home. By the time she freed herself, the car had already been sold to an unsuspecting dealer. She'd advertised her car in the Teesside Times newspaper, and we know that similar adverts in this paper have been answered by the same man. So take another look at him. He may have worked as a taxi driver or possibly as an aircraft fitter, and he's used the names George Durham and Ray Sims. Now watch this space. That man helped hijack a post office van in Leicester last month. Look at him again, this time more slowly. Notice the way his hair is shaved quite high at the temples. 
This artist's impression taken from the video may be a better likeness, and we believe this is how he looks face on. He's about 25 and 5 foot 8. We also believe he's from the London area. Ring us if you know him. Next, this man armed with a sawn-off shotgun demanded money and got away with over £2,000. Over the past few months, there have been a series of armed robberies at building societies in Yorkshire, and the first was on the 23rd of December last year at the National and Provincial Building Society in Wakefield. Two months later, at a Sheffield branch of the same building society, a camera caught what appears to be the same man as he left with £1,250. He's described as 25 to 35 years old, 5 foot 8 to 5 foot 9 inches tall, with short, dark hair and a pale complexion. If you recognise him or any of our other photo call faces, call us now. And the number, as always, is 01811 And your call will be in confidence. It's 01811 We've just had some information that uh, a caller has rung us who appears to know a great deal about the John Lawrence murder. He's promised to call again. Please keep that promise. Please call again this evening, now if you can. It will be in confidence. Nick. Our final film tonight retraces the last five days of a young Cardiff woman, Lynette White. Lynette was 20. She lived with and helped to support a boyfriend and was hoping to settle down with him and have children. Instead, on Valentine's Day, Lynette was murdered. This is Cardiff's Docklands, Tiger Bay. Good morning all and welcome to Wednesday Street Life. For a day, Gigid, Frank Hennessy Summer. I'm now with you until half past 12. And we're on a bit of a crusade today. Welcome back to Meet for Lunch and to our phone in on women at work and the extent of Red Dragon News. This is Martin Shankleman. Lynette was a practical girl striving to make a living for herself after a troubled childhood. At the age of 18, she turned to prostitution. Every night, seven nights a week, she'd work here from 6 p.m. till 1 a.m., often taking clients to a flat in James Street. When she stopped work early in the morning, she went regularly to meet friends at a nearby club. You always steal my cigarettes. Oh, come on, no, there's I've plenty. Got, I've got come seven on, there's left. plenty behind the van. This is the last one. Well, I only knew Lynette from the club, but. More of a friend than the taxi driver, you know, as the time went on, like. She used to talk a lot and dream a lot and, you know, like any other young girl, like, you know. But uh, herself, she was a cracking girl and I used to think of a lot of it, like, you know. Hey, Jack, how's your back? Hey, Jack. Good to see you. That's you. On Tuesday afternoon, Lynette left her flat in Grangetown, and for five days, she disappeared. She was seen around the city, but she avoided her closest friends. This chemist shop is just around the corner from Lynette's flat, and she came here every Saturday to buy supplies of condoms. Lynette walked in as usual on Saturday the 13th, her fifth day away from home. Later on that evening, an old school friend saw Lynette standing outside a disco known as Monty's. Lynette almost certainly was not waiting for her father. She hadn't seen him in a year. It's not known if she did meet someone here or left alone, but she stayed here till sometime after 1 a.m. By now, it's Sunday. It's February the 14th, Valentine's Day. That afternoon, a woman walking down James Street noticed a man who was standing in a doorway. He appeared to have blood on his hands. 
This is next door to where Lynette took clients. The witness walked past the Maritime Museum and stood looking out to sea when she felt someone sit down beside her. It was the man from James Street. At 8.45 that Sunday evening, Lynette's best friend went round to check the James Street flat. She was worried by Lynette's disappearance. When she saw a door locked shut that was normally open, she called the police. Charlie Quebec 07, I need a console. Very urgently over. Yes, from uh, Charlie Quebec 07, I'm at number 7 James Street. I've just broken in and found the dead body of a woman inside, and it appears to be a suspicious death. From Charlie Quebec 07, uh, Roger, that's the will come. 07, come to one Could you inform the inspector and the CID to attend? and also get the police surgeon out of it. John Williams calling it a suspicious death turned out to be uh, the understatement of the year. It was the most appalling attack on her. She had uh, been stabbed, I think, was it over 50 times and had her throat cut. Terrible Indeed, attack. that is so. It was a very cruel, vicious and violent murder after what is a young girl. Now, the man seen virtually outside the flat that she used to take clients to. It must be the prime suspect, a man who was mumbling, incoherent. I gather he was crying at times, too, blood on his hands. That is right. He certainly is a person who we must speak to at this time. Would other people have, have seen him? And if so, how would they have noticed him? We've, we've compiled a, a, a Crime Watch video fit. What are the distinctive features? He is very distinctive. He's got dark brown, greasy hair with lightning towards the front of it. He's about 35 to 40 years of age and between 5 foot 8 and 6 foot tall. And we must remember that this man was bleeding himself, he's cut himself, he's also got blood on him from the deceased. He's upset, he's crying, and he's in a bit of a state. And presumably might have sought medical attention himself. Well, indeed, cut himself. that is so. Why, why had she left her flat for five days, do you know? Well, she's, had, she? she's had a bit of a tiff with her boyfriend, and I think she's had problems with going to court to give evidence. She is a local girl. She would have stayed somewhere in the area. There is no doubt that someone out there knows where she stayed, and we would like those persons to come forward and speak to us. To eliminate them, obviously. That is so, yes. Everybody seems to speak terribly highly of this girl. She was tremendously liked and admired, and I gather even a, a large number of her clients have come forward who went to her well, as, a, as she was a prostitute. Yes, of course she was, but she was a popular girl. She was a quiet girl. She was well-liked. But there are other clients in the city and outside the city who ought to come forward and tell us when they've been with her so that we can eliminate them from the inquiry. Well, Lynette's uh, family and close friends have put up uh, a reward of £1,000. Here's the number. 01811 That's 01811 Or you can call the incident room in Cardiff. That's on 0222 398 381. 0222, the code for Cardiff, 398 381. Well, detectives and researchers taking calls have been very busy tonight. Uh, one caller we just heard has recognised that Mauser gun, which we showed on incident desk. He wants more details about that. If you'd like to ring back, we can give you more details. Or um, watch our update programme at 20 past 11 when we'll show the gun again and give more details. Uh, somebody else has called to say that the wire used in the Welsh bombs has been recognised. And he says it comes from a typewriter firm which used to trade, trade in Portsmouth Dog. And he also, somebody also says that the clips have, clips have been recognised. In fact, we've had quite a lot of callers who've recognised those clips as clips which are sold by the Tandy's chain of stores who usually take the name and address of customers. So police will be following that one up too. We'll keep you posted. If the lines are busy now, please don't give up because we're going to be here answering the telephones until midnight. You'll find all the local relevant police numbers on CFAX if you have that. That's on page 186. And we'll give them again in the Crime Watch update programme at 11.20. So do join us in you ca if you can. Or phone local police or you can write to us at Crime Watch UK, BBC Television, London W12 8QT. The uh, essence of Crime Watch, of course, is that it doesn't help to worry about crime. We need to do something about it, all of us. And that theme has now been taken up in this new government campaign. And as part of that campaign, Douglas Hurd, the Home Secretary, toured the Crime Watch studio before we came on the air tonight and met some of the detectives who are investigating tonight's cases. It's a good, it's a good take up. It's very good, yes. actually. Yes. Now, your campaign, really, is sort of taking up where Crime Watch leads off. Yes, so, I mean, what you've shown is that people are anxious to help the police, but that shouldn't be just once a month when there's Crime Watch. And what we're trying to put across is two things. First of all, 
rising crime isn't inevitable. In some places, it's now actually falling. It's still very high. And everybody, everybody can do something to help. And our booklet, our handbook, is designed to show exactly how. In the last 10 or 20 years, in tackling crime, the main emphasis has been on putting more resources in the hands of the police. Is there a growing recognition that really isn't enough, that we, the community, are going to have to be at the forefront? Well, I'm sure it's been right to put more resources into the police, and there are now 20,000 more people working with the police than there were in 79. So that must be right, but you're also correct. It isn't the whole answer. I mean, even if you had a police officer on every street corner, you wouldn't actually be coping with the problem unless the community itself, everybody, helped and there are many ways in which they can do that. Well do phone for a booklet, it's free, a hundred thousand have been asked for in the first week and we strongly recommend it. As I said it's free, the number is 01 200 1000, that's 01 200 1000. But only use this number for a copy of the booklet. We'll be back from a month from now, or rather he will, Patty Coldwell will be here in my place while I take a quick break from the programme to have a baby, from both of us. And from both of us. Good night. Good night. Well, welcome back. Although we've had quite a steady flow of calls in the last hour and a half, we've had a disappointing lack of information on some of tonight's cases, but some very important details have come through on some of the other ones, including our Welsh arsonist case. If you uh, remember, our first case this evening was about incendiaries in Wales and uh, in Chester. Incendiaries were posted at estate agents in Chester, which nearly burned down the city's medieval city centre. The devices uh, have been linked to a series of attacks on homes in North Wales, on holiday homes in particular, attacks that have gone back for eight or nine years. Now, we've had a large number of calls. Gwyn Williams has been uh, coordinating them. You're actually quite pleased with the response, I gather. In, indeed I am. We've, we've had an excellent response in relation to the source of the crocodile clips and a very interesting line on the wire which we will need to follow through in the next few now, days. These, these were components of the bombs that that's they've right, been using in recent right. weeks and months. That's right. I mean, we were very anxious to trace the origin of these. And the two types of alarm clock that they seem to have either been buying repeatedly or buying in batches or getting from somewhere in batches. Again we've had an encouraging response to, to that and we will be following that through again in the next few days. Now your principal concern and I know that you're getting some calls in but there's not a lot you can say. Your principal concern is to get names from people who may be sympathetic in some respects to, to some of the motives behind these bombings, but just can't stomach the potential violence of it all. That's right. I, I would really like to hear from people, as we said earlier, who might be on the fringe of these groups. I'd like them to ring me. OK. Well, I fear that you may be right. If they don't, someone's going to get very badly hurt in this. Mr Williams, thanks very much indeed. Sue. Well, now the armed raid in the Cleveland town of Hartlepool. Five men attacked a post office delivery van as it stopped at a sub-post office on the central housing estate. The gang used a number of cars, four in fact, including a distinctive red BMW Alpina. Detective Chief Inspector Ron Newsom's in charge of the case. What sort of response have you had? In fact, well, quite a few calls on the Yes, list. we've had an excellent response um, so far. We've had over 80 calls, mainly concerned with the red BMW. Uh, several sightings, several suggestions, We've had some names put forward uh, from the video fits, and we've had one call in relation to the golf clubs. What's surprising is that there weren't more calls and more interesting calls about the golf clubs, because they are so distinctive, aren't they? Yes, they're a Ben Hogan Apex set of golf clubs. 
They were made specially long for the owner, who is very tall, so they were extended by two inches, and they had a brown leather grip put on at that stage, which is unusual for that particular set of golf clubs. So only extra tall people could actually hope to use that, those as golf clubs? That's right. Uh, any person who's purchased these golf clubs innocently has nothing to fear by coming forward to us. Um, that may lead us actually to the gang in the end. Could be much more important than you realise, in fact. And several people have rung in to say, could, we, could they see the video fits again? Yes, they so have. Can we have those descriptions? Yes, the first video fit is of the man who was seen as the driver of the Datsun Bluebird in Gower Walk. He's got curly hair, he's uh, thin and about 5 foot 8 and 35 years old. The second video fit, that was the, the passenger who was in the red Astra van when the cables were cut. And he's slightly younger, about 30 years old, and as you can see, he's got a fringe over the right side of his forehead. Right, calls if you recognise those men. Thank you very much indeed, Mr Newsom. Now to that murder in Cardiff on Valentine's Day. Lynette White was last seen outside the Montmorenz Club in the city centre. The following day, a man was seen outside a flat that Lynette used to take clients to. She was uh, a prostitute. Detective Chief Superintendent John Williams has been coordinating the calls. With what effect? Yes, we've had more than 50 calls to our Cardiff studio and we've had several calls here tonight, as you know. A man has called at a police station in Cardiff and has offered certain background information about Lynette and this is being eliminated at the present time. Now, we should make it clear this man is a potential witness. He's giving information. It's not remotely suspected that he's the murderer. No, that's quite correct. But you have had a call from someone who says he thinks he knows who the murderer might be, or at least he thinks he knows where Lynette was staying. We've right? had a very interesting call from a male person in the Cardiff area who says that he knows where Lynette stayed during those five vital days. We would like this man to contact us again as he has not revealed that address and it is very, very important to this inquiry. As a thousand pounds reward on, on this, we, we should re repeat, which has been put up by the family. We've got a video fit, of course, of a man who was seen almost next door to the flat where Lynette was found. He had blood on his hands. Just take another look at that. Just give us that description again. That man is aged between 35 and 40 years. He's about five foot eight to six feet tall. He is scruffy and he has dark brown greasy hair with lighter hair crossing the top of his head. He is very upset. He is bleeding from his hand and he's crying and someone somewhere knows who he is. This is the afternoon or early evening of Valentine's Day. Certainly, yes. Mr Williams, thank you very much. So. Well, now the calls we've had on incident <coughs> desk and photo call. David, um, we did make an appeal during the programme again for somebody to call back on the murder of John Lawrence in Isleworth in Middlesex. Somebody rang and then rang off. Yeah, she still hasn't called back yet, so unfortunately. So if she is watching, please call us. Your call will be treated in the strictest confidence. We have had some information, though, about that Nesco uh, compact disc player that we showed. Uh, it looks as though we may have found that, but uh, that's something to follow up. There is still some other property outstanding, though, that was lost, for example, a diary that he, he'd uh, lost from the scene of the crime. We still would appeal, too, to the gay community. We've had very little information from the gay community in the area of Isleworth. Your calls will be treated in the strictest confidence. If you don't want to speak to us, the police, then please ring here. There are BBC researchers who will take your calls. And it's the 7th and to the 9th of last month, remember. Uh, what about the Interpol case? Did anybody recognise the artist's impression of the man who was found dead near Amsterdam? Yes, a lot more calls on that one, Sue. Uh, we showed the picture of the man. Well, people rang in and said they think they know who he is, including a man who said he was on a sailing course with him last summer, has a photograph of the man that he's talking to us about. A social worker ran with a name. Three calls, in fact, suggested that man is something to do with the army and indeed giving details of a possible unit that he was connected with. So we'll be following that one up. Any news well. on that incinerated jewellery? Very little. We've had a couple of suggestions about where it could have come from, but don't really hold out too much hope. The make of those watches, Sue, is Nevada. Now, it's a very unusual make. Well, I haven't heard of it before. If you know where it could have come from, still call us, please. And on photo call, the man who answered a car for sale advert and then stole the car. Yes, a couple of possible names. Showed you the photo fit of the man. There he is again. If you think you know who he is, those names we've got already might not be the right ones. So you still call us. And the Armed Building Society robber in Yorkshire, we just want one more look at him, don't we? Yes, two calls there. One name could be the one, may not be. We've had a request to see him again. Well, take there a close is. look. Call us. David, thank you. Helen. What uh, have you heard? The, the case that must have caused wry grins all across the country from Crime Watch viewers, a gang of fraudsters 
who had managed to take a home video of themselves and leave yes. the cassette for the police to find. Yes, that's right. It was found in a house in Norfolk. Well, there have been some very positive leads on this. If you remember, it was David Silverman, the ra a rather tall guy, six foot two with a, a Manchester accent, and he was with his... Um, well, let's say he was with a, a younger man who purported to be his stepson. That's David, uh, Ronald Silverman. He was, in fact, caught at a BBC Antiques Roadshow. There was also a third person, Philip Parrott. This picture was caught, though. We shouldn't say he himself was caught. He is still <laughs> at, at large. That, that's right, and obviously we want to pin him down. As I said, we have had positive leads, in fact, pinning them to a certain area. So hopefully that will turn out quite fruitful. Uh, every time I went back there, people were ringing about divers', divers helmets helmet. and you wanted in connection with that. There's fraud. been a marvellous response well over 110 calls of sightings of these helmets so obviously that will take some time to filter through that gun German Mauser pistol tell us about that yes well it's it's part of a, a rather large inquiry going on in Manchester and the police there, they want to know who has possessed this gun. As you said, it's a Mauser. It's only that particular one they want, That's isn't it? right. It's got a serial number of 142503. Number of calls, but rather a disappointing response, particularly aiming at the collector or the souvenir hunter. Maybe they've seen it in someone's possession. Then there was that very uh, unusual-looking man who robbed the Cheshire Building Society at uh, Queen's Ferry. Well, everyone here thought he was a very distinctive guy. His height, 5'1 to 5'3, and those distinctive protruding teeth with a large gap in the middle. Some viewers thought they might be false teeth. Well, we understand not. He didn't speak with any speech impediment. We believe that they are his. Rather a disappointing response. Very little to tell you off on that one. OK, there was a hijack of a post office van in Leicester. It just so happened that a, a suspect walked past a shop which had a security camera on him. What calls on that? Well, up to a few moments ago, we had absolutely nothing. But then we had one very interesting piece of information linking that man with a robbery in Watford. If anyone has any information that could help us on that lead, Please call. OK, and I should just say, we've just heard that a man uh, has been arrested and charged in connection with an item we carried on Crime Watch some time ago about a theft of a series of Mercedes cars, if you remember that. Because a court case appears to be pending, I'm afraid I can't give you any more details on it. So. And that's it for tonight. Our lines here at the studio will be closing down at midnight, but we'll give you a list of the local relevant numbers in a moment. And if you still can't get through, just contact your local police, please. There'll be more news about tonight's developments on open air tomorrow. News is still coming in, of course. That's at 11.25 a.m. We'll be back, as always nowadays, on the second Thursday of the month. That's Thursday, the 14th of April. Well, Nick will be back, actually, then, but uh, I'm due to have a baby in a few days' time, and I hope to have just a few days off. I think I deserve it, but I'll be back in May. So, till then, goodbye from me. And good night from them. <laughs> good night. <laughs> goodbye. Yeah.